Africa considered one of the highest uh, growth regions in the world, and it also has close proximity to us here from Dubai. It's been growing quite well. Uh, we can expect the growth to continue if you look at the numbers. The non-oil trade between Dubai and Africa has one of the highest growth rates. It's grown from 10 billion US dollars in 2008 to 30 billion US dollars in 2014. Uh, we expect this growth to continue going forward. In Africa, when you look at the north, we have Egypt, our largest trading partner with close to 16 billion dirhams worth of trade. And we see quite a good growth going forward because of the positive momentum and developments happening in Egypt. In the south, we have South Africa, around close to 10 billion uh, dirhams. And uh, again, we, we see the momentum will continue because of the region in, in South Africa. Also, we have Sudan with a close to 9 billion dirhams worth of non-oil trade. We realize that the whole world wants to do business in Africa, but understanding Africa is one of the biggest challenges. And this is why we launched last year an app, a smart application focusing in, in Africa and the opportunities and more of the basic understanding that we understand that main businessman who wants to do business in Africa has to, to know these basics. The African Global Business Forum is a main platform for us to connect Africa with the world and connect the world with Africa. And of course, Dubai sits in the middle of that. Uh, we try to connect the opportunities and talk about the challenges and connect businesses and investors from both sides. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, ministers, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, a fascinating last session, I think. And now it's my pleasure to ask you to uh, be seated for the next session, which is uh, entitled The Infrastructure of Trade, Africa and the Global Economy, uh, which is really getting down to the, the nitty gritty. I'd like uh, to ask Ethna uh, Trainer whom I think many of you will know very well, to moderate this session. And I'd like to invite uh, His Excellency Sultan Ahmed bin Saliem, the chairman of uh, DP World, to come up to the platform. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, John. I'll call up. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you all so much for being here. And if I may now invite the chairman of DP World to please join me on the stage. And we have a half an hour for this very enlightening conversation, and I know it will be. Thank you so much. Now, of course, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with the chairman of DP World, His Excellency Sultan Ahmed bin Suleim. Um, he is one of the leading visionaries in the UAE, particularly in Dubai. He is absolutely passionate about the power of free trade and free international trade and what it can do for companies, for countries, and indeed for people. And of course, in his earlier career, he really has spearheaded tourism, investment, and property development in this region. And he now heads up one of the biggest ports in the world right here in Dubai. Of course, so we're absolutely thrilled to have you here, DP World a company that has, you've had a very good year, well done, congratulations on that. When many companies are not doing as well as perhaps they should be, we're seeing DP World coming up with 11% increase in profits. We're seeing some tremendous work. You're a cash rich company, you have great um, vision out there in terms of what you're looking for. Tell me how important is Africa to DP World? Very important for us. We have uh, six terminals in five countries. Uh, we have two in Algeria, uh, one in Djibouti, one in Maputo, in Mozambique, uh, and one in Dakar, and one, of course, in Sukhna, Egypt. 
And when you look at what you've done already, I mean, that's some investment that you've put in place there. And I believe you're in Africa since the late 1990s. Yes. You know, so you got in early when perhaps other people maybe were a little scared of going in. But you got in, and there's also, you look at the global growth at the moment around 3.5%, but you look at growth in sub-Saharan African at about 4.5%, and the World Bank actually saying that by 2017, we're looking at growth maybe of 5% or more. So what's the attraction there? Where's the growth, and what's bringing you in there? We believe that uh, seven out of the 10 countries in the world that have growth are in Africa. Uh, Ethiopia has a growth of about 20 percent, according to the government. And of course, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, we have uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, Kenya, and Rwanda. We see potential growth in these countries, definitely. Now, in our previous um, panel there, we were hearing, and from some members in the audience too, we were hearing perhaps a little bit of frustration. We've been here last year talking about this, and many investors, of course, looking at it. You know, the big thing is public-private partnership, getting big industry in there, getting foreign direct investment in, and you're coming, you know, with a, a very generous wallet, so to speak. You know, but what is, what do you need to actually what does Africa need to do to attract more money and to attract more investment? There's a lot of pressure on infrastructure, definitely. Uh, the almost more than half of the population of Africa today live in cities. That, is, that gives a challenge and opportunity. A challenge because you need uh, infrastructure, and if you need to build infrastructure, that brings opportunities. And there where I believe that private-public part partnership is very important. Africa needs investment in that, and the way for that definitely is through private-public partnership. But when we look at the infrastructure issue, and indeed many people have talked about this, and we read some of the reports, and we're looking at an infrastructure gap of something like, you know, $100 billion annually. I mean, this is an awful lot of money that needs to be raised, you know, in Africa. And they need to put this in place, you know, for energy, for transport, ITC, water. I mean, are they doing enough? And is, are people listening? Are the investors out there listening to say, okay, we will come and we will actually partner with you? We tried uh, private-public uh, partnership. In fact, the six terminals that we have are in partnership with the government. So it's working. Uh, one of the most successful projects in private-public partnership was the rail, rapid rail in yes, yes. South Africa for the uh, games in 2010. But if you look at the percentage of the uh, private partnership uh, in relation to that project in Africa, it's only 4%. Yes. So there is definitely a big gap. But the way to attract uh, investment, to bring foreign capital, to encourage the private-public partnership they have to be, we have to demonstrate in Africa that we will protect foreign investment. It has to be demonstrated. People have cash. The cash is available. But Africa is not the only place. Everywhere in the world, they need this cash. So why would you put it in Africa, especially when you talk about infrastructure projects, which means they are long term? They need to show, to demonstrate transparency. They need to show that we are protecting foreign investment. One bad example could scare everybody out. So this is, I think, a key. And that's why to raise money in Africa today is very difficult and expensive. If you want to raise money in Nigeria, for example, you're talking about between 8 to 12 percent. And that will kill any project. So it actually makes sense, really, to bring in foreign investment when they can. It's cheaper to raise the money. And actually, again, but it's getting interest. When you talk about protecting foreign investment, now, as you say, the money is out there, but every country in the world is competing for that money. Absolutely. And developed countries are competing. So it's not just about emerging markets. It's like if you have a port that you want to, to run, to manage, and you've got a big investment to come with it, they will be lining up at your door and not just from Africa. So when you make that choice, it, it is about bringing in international standards would you say that will make you and every other investor feel as confident about putting money in Africa as you could put money 
in the Netherlands or somewhere. Yes, definitely. And today, uh, we would invest in a developed market yeah. in Europe. We just built a port in, in, in England. Yes. And maybe the return is low, but it is safe. It's extremely safe. There is law. There, is, uh, there are courts. And the courts are separate from the government. And you know that your investment is protected. In Africa, there is opportunity. There is a growth. But this risk is perceived by many people. Now, we have experience in Africa. We are, we are investing. So we have more courage than many people. But I'm looking at the outsider. They always perceive the risk before the opportunity. And nobody will go to a place where it is risky today. Now, again, you have some tremendous operations already in Africa. And we do have to just acknowledge the fact, too, you have a little bit of an issue in Djibouti. I mean, you have a wonderful operation there. You're going to continue. You're still continuing it. Um, but is that a situation that you're convinced will get resolved? And um, I know it's something you can't really talk about, but there has been a situation there, perhaps, that you could have done without. Well, let me tell you. First of all, I cannot comment in, in Djibouti because basically today there is a, uh, an arbitration yes. in the process. So legal proceedings prevents me. I'm not allowed to talk about it. However, can understand. the port in Djibouti is providing, is almost contributing 12% of the GDP in Djibouti. The port, we give employment to almost 800 people or 900 people, 100% or 90% are Djiboutians. The port is, is actually the most modern port in Africa with amazing infrastructure. Uh, and so we are, we are very excited about our business in Djibouti. Definitely. And you've shown your commitment there. Absolutely. One of the ladies mentioned earlier too about the need for education in Africa. And I think in terms of skills, and education. I think DP World is doing some tremendous work in terms of training, bringing up the standards of, as you say, the people from Djibouti who would work there or in any other area, and also giving them world-class skills, because you bring a lot of your people to Dubai to work yes. here, yes. and you can send them, really, their, their skill to work anywhere in the world, aren't they, and be competitive. Absolutely. Actually, our uh, CFO in Algeria is a Djiboutian. We trained him. And then we wanted him to come to, he's a French speaking, and Algeria French speaking, nice. it makes sense. But had we not trained him, had we invested in training, he wouldn't be able to take that job. So also in terms of education, and I know in terms of, you know, academic education that's important, but the technical training that a company like you can deliver, and also the companies that you affiliate with, that would you say is also of prime importance in Africa? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in addition, I believe that uh, you, don't really, you don't only need the infrastructure, but you need also the soft structure. Yes, yes. You need the legal system. You need the uh, ability to uh, basically process documents swiftly. Not because we say so, but because all the shipping lines today are going to larger vessels. Everybody is talking about handling cargo faster. You cannot handle cargo faster without the EDI. We are introducing uh, electronic uh, business community, for example, in Algeria. This is something we have benefited from doing in Dubai, and now we believe that Algeria needs it. And so Tell us a little bit more about that, because that's fascinating. You have very much a, a paperless environment here in Dubai. Absolutely. And funny, somebody actually said, what about the Dubai model? So in a way, you've introduced that Dubai model, though it be for the port, um, into that. Talk to us through that a little bit. Let me tell you. Today, we handle 18 million documents. We process 18 million documents a year. That is a million and a half a month. That is 50,000 a day. That used there to be a no lot way, of bureaucracy, huh? There is no way on earth you can handle 50,000 documents a day. And I, I don't believe we would be able to even reach 18 million TUs, 18 million uh, documents a year had we not invested in transforming the government to electronic government. It helped us so much. It made our job easier. And the government was very smart when His Highness Sheikh Mohammed announced it. He said the government is going to be electronic. Of course, he wanted to change the, the private sector, but he said the government, because if the government changed the communication to electronic communication, the private sector will have to change, because how would they communicate to the government? I remember years ago, we have a huge counters in the customs. Today, they are empty hallways. There's no need for it.
And with the smart government, yes. the app allows people to process document, not during office hours, but any time. Yes. And that's important. And when you go with EDI, electronic uh, documentation, when you go with smart uh, systems, you eliminate corruption. And everything, and, and then information is king, and you can get the information that you need with a click. And so this is what's helping us in Dubai, and we're trying now to uh, promote this experience. You, you, you might be able to build the most modern port. You might be able to put the best equipment, but if the system doesn't allow it to move out, it's a problem. And that builds efficiency, as you're Absolutely. saying, as well. And um, please, we do have time to take some questions. Nick got you all in tune with how you're going to relate to us. We have many microphones, three in the front, two at the back. And anybody here at all, if you'd like to ask a question, we do have a few minutes. Um, coming back to that efficiency, you know, that effectiveness, and again, building in the transparency that your system has built. Um, also, just the technological advancements that you bring in terms of setting up a port in Africa. Yes. I mean, you're often maybe not building a brand new port, but you're bringing in, you know, a greenfield that's going to be probably among one of the most modern in the world when, when you do go into place. Absolutely. And how important is that too for shipments coming in? And again, talk to me a bit about what happens to shipments after they come in, the intra-regional Let me issues. tell you, what, what we have is, uh, as I mentioned, in certain areas, if the infrastructure uh, is needed and is not built, then we have to be creative yes. in our approach. And so how do we deal with it? In, for example, Pakistan, we have an inland uh, container terminal in Lahore, which is very important uh, uh, source of cargo. And we build that, and that is helping us to release the cargo because the land of the port is a very expensive infrastructure. When you build a port, it's an expensive land. And you cannot afford to have the port terminal as a storage. Yes. And so yes. we do that. In, in India, for example, we invested in a, license, in a rail license from the government. And we actually run our own rail from the port of Nebashiva into the hinterland. Uh, have we done that? Not, have we not done that? We'll be stuck with cargo. And India is, is, is an important uh, place for us. And exactly, the port is way too um, prime property to be Absolutely. just a storage. Absolutely. So having done that in India and also in Pakistan, you can replicate that Absolutely. in Africa. Absolutely. Are you looking at regions? Talk to me about Senegal. I know you've got a big port there already, and you're looking at developing the free zone as well, because you're not just operating the port. Since we came to the port, we almost doubled the, uh, the container uh, throughput. Uh, today, the port is handling so much cargo, there is no way uh, you, can, you can basically expand it. Even if you put equipment, because it is a port in the city, it will take 70 hours to get a truck out. 70 hours. Which means we have to go somewhere else. Uh, the government built a new airport. And in my last meeting with the president, he welcomed the idea of moving the port closer to the airport. So it will be outside of the city, and in between the airport and the port, it will be a free zone. This is basically replicating what we did in Jabal Ali. Jabal Ali, exactly. probably 50% of our business is from the logistic operations in Jabal Ali. And we have learned in the last maybe 30 years the ups and downs, what worked, what didn't work. And so we are coming with the knowledge and experience how to fast track the operation. We don't need to spend 30 years in, exactly. to achieve where we did today. We know what worked and we're going to go ahead. We know what didn't work and we're going to waste our time. This is the same method we're doing in London. London Gateway is also a port and a logistic park. And it works beautifully. So you're really duplicating one of the finest ports in the world with the port, the free zone, the airport, all in one, in, in Senegal. I mean, that's just incredible. Well done. Absolutely. It's great. I have a question here from Adolf, and he said, what are the major bottlenecks when operating ports in Africa? So the major bottlenecks that you have to deal with. Actually, uh, I have a figure here about the 
The but bottlenecks but probably come when you're trying to move stuff out of the port, yes. but also in terms of actually operating. Not only operating. that, the, 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 the bureaucracy and the red tape Still. Uh, kills the business. Yeah. And in fact, uh, if you put a dollar value on it, it's a huge amount. So sometimes uh, there are certain rules and regulations which allows the port to operate where the customs uh, basically translates it different. So they have to be a lot of coordination. The system has to adapt to how the cargo can be done. So there are bottlenecks. Yes. As I mentioned, there are soft problems and there are infrastructure problems. Infrastructure, we know it, it's road and so on. But most importantly, there are regulations and there are red tape and there are time that it takes for a cargo. Maybe the cargo is ready, but by the time you want to take it out to the city, either bottleneck in the road or bottleneck in the system. This is the problem. Uh, and who pays for this? The consumer. Yes. Today, for example, from the probably uh, uh, China to Mombasa, maybe you talk about $2,000 a container, but from Mombasa to Uganda will be four to $5,000. Again, that shows that this is a cost that, at the end of the day, the consumer is paying. And that is, when you think about it, I mean, that is ridiculous because you get the goods there, they enter into the port, you know, there's plenty of entry areas whereby you can bring it in, and then it's moving it on. But sadly, there are so many countries in Africa that are landlocked, they need these goods. Absolutely. And if anything, they're the countries that probably can afford them least, and especially can afford to pay such an outrageous, almost, it's, it's not a duty, it's just the travel costs. Yes. So, is it about the different states and the different countries coming together and agreeing? I mean, many of the trade zones, it, they work well, but it doesn't seem to be working as well as it should. Actually, this is the reason why there is no inter-African yes. business. Very little. Very little. Everybody comes from outside because to get it between the two countries to trade among each other, it's difficult because of infrastructure and because of red tape and bureaucracy. And between the two, you can see the, the result. And sadly, this is still, I mean, there must be some areas of improvement from time to time. There I mean, are. We're where, still where, investing. But... Where we are, actually, yes. we have convinced the government. They realize the importance of change, and they change. But in the bigger picture, to actually move, you know, to move trade at a, a rapid, to really accelerate trade, and that's what they need to do. Absolutely. It's not about drip feeding. It's actually about really moving the market. Absolutely. To do that, they just have to actually, are you saying that they have to just sit back, look at what's going on here, and just take action, sign maybe some new laws and sign some new agreements? Yeah, the problem, it takes such a long time. I mean, I mean, we are used to Dubai. You have a problem, you fix it, yeah. or you go to, if you can't fix it, you go to the government, the government will fix it. But that process is very fast. And unfortunately, even though sometimes they realize it, they, a lot of people get uh, entrapped in that we need to have a proper regulation to do this. And what I'm saying is, there is no way somebody can invent or create a law that nobody can penetrate or abuse. If there is such a smart legal person that can create for us a law that nobody can abuse, then there is no need for lawyers, no need for <laughs> judges, no need for jails. Basically, yes. What we are saying is that any law can be changed. In Dubai, we'll draft a law. And if we discover later on that we are in a hurry and there is a loophole, we fix it. But you cannot penalize the, business, the good businessman because of one bad businessman. That should not be the case. The law should not be the case tailor-made for a bad businessman. Because this way you are hurting everybody else who genuinely want to do business. In business, people will violate, people will take advantage. This is the normal way of doing their business. Our job is really to, first you want them, second you find them, you keep finding, and then later on, you devise something to deal with this bad person. But do not devise a law that is so difficult just because one bad person abused it. And again, it's about good governance, it's about good peer pressure Absolutely. and good practice from, you know, business people like yourself. And ultimately, it's not just about doing business. This 
is about building the community. Absolutely. And unfortunately, this, sir, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, and I'm so sorry that you've been waving at me there. I just spotted you. Um, we've come to the end of this time. Um, again, as you're saying here, a lot of work that needs to be done. We're hearing this theme already as we start this conference. So once again, thank you for enlightening us with all of the work that you're doing there. And again, giving us that inspiration we need to really get down to action and get business moving in Africa, because that's what it's about. Thank you so much. The chairman of DP World, ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency, Sultan Ahmed bin Sulaim. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to now, doubtless to your great relief, even though it's been an excellent morning so far, we have a networking break. And you also have a chance for a cup of coffee. So, uh, but I'd, just a couple of things. If you could be back here by 12 noon, because we will have two presidents and also Sheikh Shebani. And uh, I would encourage you, the second thing, to prepare questions in advance for the president of, Ru of Rwanda and the president of Somalia. Please enjoy uh, your coffee break now. And you, when we come back, we will have two presidents plus uh, Sheikh Shebani. Thank you very much indeed.